Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 30th of August and nearly September, and then before you know it, it'll be Christmas. New videos this week. I actually created quite a detailed video all around the integrations between resources in virtual networks and platform as a service resources, things like storage account, Cosmos, etc. So this goes into things like network security groups, service tags, service endpoints, service endpoint policies, and private link. So a kind of holistic approach to how I can control um, the connectivity between things in VNet and my PaaS services. And I did a really quick video. Um, a lot of people had asked about the equipment I use and my setup. So this is like a five minute video just walking through, hey, my recording environment and the equipment I use, if you're interested. So what's new? Uh, a quieter week compared to last week. And as always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. But we did have this new Azure Durable Functions for PowerShell. Um, go into preview. So Azure Functions is one of the serverless technologies. It's phenomenal. And I can use different languages. I can use C Sharp, F Sharp, JavaScript, Python, JavaScript, and PowerShell. And ordinarily, Azure Functions is actually a great way to run PowerShell. I can trigger based on some event, like from Event Grid, for example, saying writes to a blob, I could trigger a PowerShell. Um, I could have an endpoint, a RESTful API to trigger PowerShell, a schedule. And durable functions are all about the idea that, hey, I have this longer running function that maybe needs to wait for something to happen. Maybe there's multiple steps to a process. Maybe it fans out. Maybe it's waiting for human interaction. So durable functions give me that capability. It gives me the ability to maybe have an orchestrator function that calls other functions. Maybe, for example, an interesting scenario could be, well, hey, maybe I have some master function that then has to call many other functions and then when they all complete, it kind of goes back and carries on. And they could maybe take a long time. And with ordinary functions, that would be pretty difficult to do. With durable, hey, I can have this function go and asynchronously call all these others and then go into a wait state. I, I stop paying for the compute. And then it can wake up when they have all completed or after a certain duration. And so the point of this is now, I can use these with PowerShell. There's a set of PowerShell commands that I can now leverage with durable functions. On the storage side, um, AZ Copy 10.6, this now has a bunch of new capabilities. It can preserve ACLs for services that support it. So if I was copying maybe from um, a Windows file share to Azure files, uh, it can keep those. I can do a persist SMB permissions. Um, I can also um, keep things like write time, update time, when I'm doing those same types of copies. There's support for blocks of blobs for 4,000 megabytes now, which means I can get a total of like 190 terabytes when you think about multiple blocks make up an entire blob. So now AZ Copy has been enhanced to support these new capabilities. The Cosmos DB serverless is in public preview. Now Cosmos is phenomenal. It supports a whole bunch of different types of APIs if I need graph storage, columnar, document, um, table, etc. But ordinarily I have to use these request unit things that every time I do some operation it uses a certain amount of request units and they can be very hard to understand well, how many do I actually need. I had to provision them up front. So I would maybe pay for too many, or I wouldn't do enough, and then I'd be throttled. So what the serverless does is it enables me to say, hey, uh, you don't have to pre-provision. I'll bill you for the request units you actually use up to a certain number. You can specify, hey, I don't want to pay more than this. So I'm only paying for the amount I actually need. Now, this serverless option is only available for the Cosmos DB Core SQL API, i.e. documents, today. It's also only a single region. So ordinarily with Cosmos, 
I can say, hey, I want this in all these different regions. I can kind of check boxes where I want this data. I can even do multiple write ordinarily. Um, today for this server list, it's a single region. Also, it can only burst up to 5,000 RUs per second. Now, that is quite a lot, but realize that's the limit today. But that's what it can burst up to, but it's not guaranteed to be there. There's like a service level objective, I think it's 95% that you should always be able to get up to that. But potentially you wouldn't be able to, depending on what else is going on on other systems, you may not get up to 5,000. Which is why if this was your critical production workload, if I knew I had to be able to always have a certain amount of performance available to me, the service may not be the right option. For dev, for testing, for non-critical, fantastic. But if I have to always have a certain amount of performance available, this doesn't guarantee that. It should be there most of the time, but probably I'll still use the provisioned option for my core critical production workloads. But hey, uh, for other scenarios, this is a great way to really go and save money on my Cosmos DB. ADLS Gen 2 uh, ACL recursion update, that is in public preview. So ordinarily, so ADLS Gen 2 sits on top of Blob. Blob ordinarily has no structure. What this ADLS does, is it sits on top of Bob, another API, and it's a POSIX style file system. I can have ACLs. But what actually happens ordinarily is, the way POSIX works is I could kind of think about, well, let's say I, I had some folder there, and let's say I have some ACL on it. And then I create child objects. So I create an object under it. I create an object under it. I create an object. It will copy the ACL at time of creation. So I kind of think about what well, it has, whatever that ACL is. If I went and changed the ACL, so now I've kind of got a modified ACL, new objects I create will get the new ACL. But the existing ones would not. It doesn't get inherited that way. The permissions are stored on the object. If I wanted to apply the new ACL, I would have to do something to go and update all the ACLs for all of the child objects. I would have to do that recursion. So now there's actually a set of commands, there's APIs, that I can actually set and update and remove ACLs from that kind of parent and it will automatically go and update all the child objects as well. So that's what this new recursion capability does. Now I can just say, hey, I want to recursively update the ACLs on this parent object, and it will automatically set, update, remove from all the child objects for me. I don't have to go and do that recursion anymore. Miscellaneous, and the Azure CDN now has a multi-origin support for endpoints. So ordinarily, I can think about with CDN, the whole point of the content delivery network is I can think about, well, on that back end somewhere, I have my, my data. This could be storage, it could be media services, it could be web, web apps, whatever. And then I have all of the different people that kind of want to use that service all throughout the world. And of course, Microsoft has this great backbone network that everything is connected to. And they also have all of these edge locations, these kind of points of presence. And with CDN, it's actually, there were Microsoft ones, there were partnerships with Akamai, there were partnerships with Verizon, and you can actually pick which one you want. But the whole point is I have these endpoints, and then I have an origin, I where is the content coming from? And so the first time someone goes and requests something, they go to the point of presence closest to them. If it's not cached there, well, it, it will go on the Azure network, get it, bring it back as one big blob and then serve it to the person. But now that data is cached there. So when the second person goes, well, it doesn't have to go back to network for the certain time to live that I set for that caching. What the multi-origin does it lets me define origin groups. I then put origins, i.e. different storage accounts in different places in the group. I can set a priority and a waiting. There's health probes going on. So now if I had kind of the primary was unavailable for some reason, 
the endpoint could now fall over to a different origin. So I would maybe be in a different region. I have another storage account or a different media service. And these were all configured as possible origins for that particular endpoint. So if this was unavailable for some reason, hey, it can go and fall over to a different one now. So that multi-origin can be super useful for kind of the balancing and for that resiliency for my services. Um, Azure Migrate is now GA, so generally available, the physical server assessment. So ordinarily, Azure Migrate would work through the hypervisor, be it VMware or Hyper-V. It would talk to the hypervisor, discover virtual machines, and then discover performance characteristics. So it can advise on, hey, are they suitable for migration? Now, I can also do it for physical servers. And really the way that's working is instead of talking to a hypervisor, it's talking to the guest operating system. So once again, I can kind of think about there's multiple stages. I have kind of an Azure Migrate project. So that's in Azure. And then I have my kind of, my set of systems. Let's just say they're on-premises. So what we have is we have kind of this Migrate appliance. Now it's really you download something, you install it, and now this communicates and registers with that particular project. Now this appliance can now do multiple things. The first thing it will do is discover. So I can give it um, sort of a set of IP address ranges I want it to go and scan. And it will now go and actually talk to those IP addresses. So yes, it works for physical machines, but it also work for machines that are VMs that don't have access to the hypervisor. It would work if they were virtual machines, if they were in Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform, because it's now just really going to talk to the guest. It has a set of credentials it's going to use to talk to the guests, so it can find them, and then it can run an assessment. So the assessment can run in one of two modes. I can say, go and look at what it's doing, and let's capture the 95th percentile, for example. So I'm going to right size. I'm not just going to care about the resource it currently has. I care about what it's actually using. Often we very much over-provision things. Or I can just say, as on premises. Let's just find out what it has. I'll take it as is up to the cloud. So now this Azure Migrate is going to work and GA with OS instances. It's called physical because it doesn't have to work through the hypervisor but it's not just physical. It could be VMs. I'm just not going via the hypervisor anymore. It could be OS instances in other clouds. I have this little virtual appliance, a, a VM, some software installed. It's gonna go and discover, and then actually go and talk to them. There's no agent installed. I only have to have an agent if I wanna work out application dependencies. Then there is an agent to work out what's calling what. But just for kind of the performance, the sizing, doesn't need an agent for that. So now, uh, that is G8. So now I can go and discover and assess and work out, hey, is it a fit for Azure? Log analytics data ingestion limits. There was always a limit. It worked out to about six um, gigabytes per minute if it was uncompressed. So when I would get diagnostic settings in, it would limit the rate. Well, those limits have now also been applied to any um, data collection kind of agents and the data collector API. Now, if you're doing more than that, Azure has detected that already and is adjusting. They're not really hard limits I can apply to support and get them raised. So if I'm close to that, I think it's 80%, you'll get an alert, you can apply to support and they will up the limit for you. But this is just by default now, you may start getting emails if you're close to the edge. Again, if you already were, they would have raised it for you automatically. But now there are those limits in place. And that's it. So that's all the updates for this week. Um, again, comments below if there's any questions about anything we didn't cover. But uh, until next week, stay safe and take care.